both um, religion and science fiction are on the same quest, uh, you would say, that they're both interested in the same kinds of uh, big questions. Okay. And they're looking for answers for the same uh, same kind of questions, like how does the universe work? You know, how does uh, explain how do uh, uh, the, uh, the planets and the stars move and, and revolve around each other? What uh, What is the explanation for all that? Or, you know, who are we? Uh, where did we come from? Uh, what created us? Right. Uh, were we created by uh, some kind of a sentient being? Uh, was it just a, a completely um, random uh, random event that that created life? So, both, and what's the are, future going sure, to look like? Exactly, exactly. Because uh, then, then the other hallmark of, of science fiction, so much of science fiction, is that it's uh, looking to the future, uh, saying if if we are here um, right now and the state of technology is such, then where is this going to possibly lead? The story is that there are a few big questions. Who are we? Where did we come from? Why are we here? And where are we going? Science and religion have different approaches to answering these questions, with science often abstaining from prognosticating or offering more philosophical responses. But science fiction, on the other hand, often boldly goes where science has never gone before. Today, we discuss the complicated relationship between science fiction and religion. I'm Joel Ackerman. The cigar is actually a cocoa baton wafer cookie from Trader's Joe. And this is Lightwise. Barna Donovan is a professor and director of the Communications and PR Master's Program at St. Peter's University. Among the courses he teaches are mass media theory, mass media law and ethics, and film courses in conspiracy theory films, horror films, and science fiction films. Barna, thanks for joining us. Thanks a lot for having me. First of all, there's some debate on how to even define science fiction. Um, Orson Scott Card gave an interview where he said what he was told was that science fiction means that the book has rivets and metal on the cover while fantasy has trees. But it's not really as simple as that. Uh, how do you define science fiction. I would go to the next step and say that's a good start. That if it has metal and rivets or plastic and glass, it's science fiction and trees, it's it's uh, fantasy. But it's also what does it run on? The metal and rivet has to run on electricity or uh, nuclear power, something that's... Uh, <clears throat> That's quantifiable. That's uh, that's measurable and the empirical, and the re empirical exactly. Um, and then uh, the uh, fantasy runs on magic and also the kind of things that you don't have in science fiction uh, that would define it. You know, so in science fiction definitely you don't have any magic or or spells or, or wizards or or magicians. All of that belongs in uh, in fantasy. And in science fiction you have engineers and and scientists or or spaceship pilots. So they do things uh, that anyone can learn to do to, uh, uh, to, to work that empirical device and not somebody, uh, somebody special, somebody gifted uh, by, by gods or something otherworldly. So this puts, uh, you know, this, this definition to me puts Star Wars in kind of a gray area, right? Exactly. Uh, Sci-fi uh, fans, uh, they, they, they love to argue about that. Uh, there are they're, they're, they're arguments, I, I believe there's, uh, there might be a book written, uh, George Lucas on trial, uh, where they're debating this. So what is science? What is Star Wars? Is it science fiction or is it something else? Now, coming from the horse's mouth, so George Lucas himself, um, he said that he, wanted, he prefers to call it space fantasy. So he takes that word fantasy in there because it does have um, all of the archetypal settings and characters. Like It's in space and you have space pilots and, and, and robots and, and space. Lasers and, exactly, yeah. lasers. But then you also have this uh, undefined magical force uh, that runs the universe, and then uh, that that that's coming out of the realm of uh, a fantasy. So even when even when uh, he 
you know, botched episode one with midichlorians or whatever mm -hmm. is because midichlorians aren't rooted in actual mm -hmm. uh, science. Do we say that's still fantasy because it's a fake science? All right, th that was so strange. Uh, why that uh, that film went to the midichlorians? Because it kind of sounds midichlorian. It, it says kind of it has sort of a sciency uh, ring Sound, to it. Yeah, so, exactly. Um, but then it doesn't doesn't really expound on it anymore. Um, and then you have you know more um, you know religious uh, symbolism coming in there. That right. Anakin is uh, is a result of a virgin birth. Right. And so so yeah. So it's bizarre. It, 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 right. Exactly. Exactly. So it still has one foot in science fiction and then one foot in in, in fantasy and, and kind religion of, and sure, a little religion, right, right? Exactly, and and then just leaves it there and doesn't doesn't really uh, any of the other two in the prequel trilogy doesn't really do anything more with that. Yeah, the the we don't need to get into that because that's a a, a long painful discussion. Um, I'm sure we'll bring up Star Wars later. Uh, where do you place the origins of the genre? Mm -hmm. Well. Some people place it way, way back in history. Uh, some would say as far back as uh, two uh, centuries BC, uh, where oh, wow. some, some would point to uh, uh, to a, an ancient Greek uh, satirist and humorist called Lucian of Samosota, okay. uh, who wrote a story about uh, um, people being caught up in a whirlwind in a in a storm and blown up to the moon, and they uh, they they find moon dwellers and there's uh, they get into battles and they're being being oh, chased wow. around. This does sound like sure, a sci-fi. Sure. Oh, sure, story. exactly, yeah. exactly. But then when we uh, jump ahead to the 1600s, you have others who are coming from the Johann Kepler uh, as the first sci-fi writer uh, school of thought. He wrote a, a story again about traveling to other planets and, and to the moon. And, uh, here, Fascinating. Here, and, uh, although here's something interesting with uh, with Kepler that the uh, the story though does still have uh, some of the uh, uh, some of the fantasy, some of the magical elements uh, that a character uh, has a mother who pa practices witch. Uh -huh. And then in real life, at one point, uh, Kepler's mother was on trial for witchcraft, and she really? got really close to uh, getting burned at the stake for it. Uh, so, so it's still, still the uh, it's, it's an area. So where there's a little autobiography a little in there bit, right, too. Right. It's interesting that that uh, back in the day, more right, there was more blending of sure. science and uh, religion, and and maybe. Is this, I mean, is this why that uh, science fiction is so tied up with religious themes or, or, or how do you explain that? That's that's probably uh, part of the uh, part of the explanation. That that, that yeah, go back uh, some centuries and you do see uh, the overlap. Or or with Isaac Newton too. Uh, that that even though was you know, he, we, I don't I don't uh, know about. Oh Isaac. yeah, he, he was also um, very religious. In fact, he was obsessed with finding codes in the Bible that would really? reveal uh, when the end of the world uh, would be uh, would be coming about. And, and ultimately, that that both um, religion and science fiction are on the same quest. Uh, you would say that they're both in interested in the same kinds of uh, big questions okay. and they're looking for answers for the same uh, same kind of questions like how does the universe work you know, how does uh, explain how do uh, uh, the uh, the planets and the stars move and and revolve around each other what uh, what is the explanation for all that or you know who are we uh, where did we come from uh, what created us right. uh, were we created by uh, some kind of a sentient being uh, was it just a, a completely um, random Random, uh, random event that that created life. So, both, and what's the are, future going sure, to look like? Exactly, exactly. Because uh, then, then the other hallmark of, of science fiction, so much of science fiction, is that it's uh, looking to the future, uh, saying if if we are here um, right now, and the state of technology is such, then where is this going to possibly lead? A right. couple of years, a couple of decades or centuries uh, down the road. So it is a very, a very forward-looking uh, looking genre. And like that's that. interesting, again, because that's kind of what religion does, right? With, with prophets or whatever, mm -hmm. they try and say, this is what's going to happen either in the near future, in, in case of some prophets with Noah and the flood or, or whatever, uh, or in the history of the world, this is where the world's story is going to end up. Mm -hmm. Science fiction is also you know, going to be uh, going to be. Uh 
theorizing about that. Uh, that is, uh, is, is, is where we are now going to lead to a better future or a worse future. You know, you have, that's why actually you have so much of dystopian science fiction. Right. You have, uh, you have a school of thought that's, uh, that, that's, that's utopian. You, know, you have your Arthur C. Clarke or Isaac Asimov. You know, he loved the idea of robots and artificial intelligence. But I mean, you probably, if you put them on a scale, you know, all of the you know, robots running out of control, um, technology destroying the world, you know, post-apocalyptic, you know, doomsdays being created by uh, by technology. That, that in itself can be a good thing if it warns. Uh, that right. if, if you have uh, 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 scientists um, on their time off, they're reading uh, these <laughs> books. They're saying, hey, wait a minute, how can we you know, make sure you know, that the nuclear technology that we're, we're developing here is not going to uh, be used for, for warfare? Or, or You're making me appreciate science fiction more because uh, as I see these all these dystopian movies come out, I go, great, another dystopian future. You know, I, I, I've, I've become tired of here's the world in the future and it sucks. You know, it's, it's mm-hmm. just such a common uh, setting for these stories to happen. But you make a great point if it's, if it's warning us so that we don't, we go, we don't want this to happen, how can we prevent it? It's a it's a good case for science fiction. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, I think so. Absolutely. Uh, let's, uh, let's hope that they, they, they do, uh, the scientists do think of things like, well, let me see. Um, let, let's make sure that this doesn't get out of control. Yeah. So, so one of my questions is intent by the authors, right? Are they thinking of that when they write or are they simply uh, writing what they think is a fun, interesting, cool idea and... Uh, and then we take from it mm-hmm. much more meaning that, that they intended. What's your mm-hmm. sense? You've written some science fiction yourself, so that's right. what I'm asking. That, that largely, I, I think the the, uh, the vast majority of people who like to write in this genre are thinking about these issues. And then, you know, you do have the uh, uh, the, the pulp science fiction, even in the history of it, yeah, where it's, yeah. you know, it's basically like, uh, like westerns or adventure stories in space. And if you look at the covers of a lot of these old uh, uh, pulp magazines, it almost looks like it uh, could be the cover of a pulp western magazine, <laughs> but just put a, a helm, a space helm, and on the, on the guy instead of a cowboy hat, right, and right. and and a ray gun in his hand instead of uh, <laughs> instead of a revolver, and right. put a monster next to it, and they're they're pretty much the uh, the same story. But I mean that's that's a uh, uh, that has its place too. Let's see if uh, if kids, what is its place? Yeah, uh, I don't know yeah, what the pl- uh, place of pulp I, I, science fiction I, I is. I think it's it, it can be a, a good uh, gateway drug for kids <laughs> towards uh, towards serious science fiction. Okay. You know, to go in and get let's say kids uh, interested in ray guns and space travel. And then after that, as they, uh, as they grow up and they uh, get a little hungrier, hopefully, for, uh, for intelligent stories, then they'll go on to the, uh, to the more thoughtful. Uh, but, but probably uh, people who get as far as that wanting to write uh, the, the sci-fi, it's because uh, their imaginations were first sparked uh, by the pulp, and then they go on to something more serious. And, and uh, science fiction uh, writers and fans who I've met, uh, even fans who are, who are aspiring to write science fiction, Fiction, they always struck me as being very, very thoughtful people. That it's something very personal okay, uh, that they want to uh, they want to tell in their you, stories. You're you're familiar. You're much more familiar with this field than I am. So, what's your? I mean, if you were to have to guess percentages uh, of the science fiction that's coming out, either in TV or in mm-hmm. literature, um, how much of it? has what you would call substance to mm-hmm. it and how much of it is kind of fluff just for entertainment escapism or something like right, that. Right, right. Oh. In, uh, in literature, uh, there you have a large uh, percentage of, of serious uh, science fiction. It's in television and especially films these days that for, for, for a real fan, uh, you're not finding a lot of substance there. But really the imaginative uh, things I'm seeing in, in literature, I would like to see more of those in the movies. Yeah, or- it sounds like there's a, uh, based on what you're saying, there's a big space for good sci-fi, su- substantial, sure, sure. substantive sci-fi in film, then 
if if most of it's fluff. Mm-hmm. Right. That, that's if if I was uh, um, running a movie studio or a production company, and and I would think of uh, making a sci-fi film, I'd say, go and get me some authors. Yeah. You know, who are the really thoughtful authors? So so think people who comment on on the environment or genetic engineering or or the internet and and the loss of privacy because of uh, the way the technology is is developing. Get me some of those people and and let's adapt uh, their uh, their their books into uh, into movies or at least uh, have them go and write some the same kind of thoughtful original things and screen screenplay. Well, so as you know, our podcast is supported by Angel Studios and they have a project that uh, they'll be distributing. It's a film called The Shift, which is kind of a uh, blend. This the screenwriter went went to another author. He went to the book of Job, I guess, for his inspiration, but it's set in the modern day, but it's got this strong element of um, science fiction where there's, uh, I don't know, I hope I'm not giving any spoilers away, otherwise we'll have to edit this out, but <laughs> there's a device that uh, transmits people between different dimensions or alternate realities. And yet there's there's many moral implications mm-hmm, right. to this, going back to this idea that science fiction and, uh, and religion are often asking these same questions. So I want to talk about that a little bit more. In the real world... Uh, science and religion don't seem to get along or people perceive a great contradiction there. In science fiction, as you've pointed out, they're asking a lot of the same big questions. So the obvious question is why do their answers so widely differ? Mm-hmm, right, because uh, science fiction, since it's rooted in science and the uh, in the empirical, um, they will say that I'm asking that same question: How can we create a better world, um, a, a utopian future? Everybody wants that. You know, how can we uh, get along uh, better? You know, not not yeah. destroy each other in in, in wars. So uh, since uh, since you can't test uh, things like the spiritual, or you can't prove that there's a god or or Satan or, or demons, that's uh, that's the realm. Of, of faith and and, and your your personal belief, then this genre, uh, since uh, it will have science in the uh, in the title of it, and so that we're we're going to uh, deal with the uh, the the, uh, the scientific questions and the implications for those uh, for those solutions that we can build a better a better future or you know hopefully avoid a really bad one um, by uh, by by looking at our technology, maybe making better technology or or reigning in uh, the uh, the destruction destructive uh, effects of, of other technologies, whereas uh, fantasy or, or religion will say that you can find uh, your answers um, in, in the, uh, uh, say, in the, in the holy texts of your, of your faith and, and, you know, what your faith tells you about how, the, uh, about how your God had inspired uh, people in the past and how that can be a, a yeah, guide for you. you bring up an interesting point. Does, does science fiction, right, religion asks, how can we make a better future? Does science fiction deify technology? Is it making technology <laughs> the god, the answer? Uh, certain uh, types of science fiction do. Um, you have, uh, well, say like with uh, with Isaac Asimov, uh, that you know, he wrote a number of uh, stories about robots, and and definitely the, uh, the he is very pro technology, very very pro robot. I mean, even in stories where it looks like the robots might go haywire and do some damage, actually they don't. Uh, okay. uh, on the end, uh, so so definitely that's uh, that's very very much uh, pro science, uh, deifying it, like 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 yeah, you said, yeah. or or. Uh, or a TV series like like Star Trek, uh, where the uh, the edict from from its creator Gene Roddenberry was that uh, the future is going to be positive, you know, because it was created in the mid '60s as as the world was getting very turbulent. Okay. You know, the, uh, the the civil rights movement was started. Right. And Vietnam was getting uh, getting worse. Uh, so he says the, the the future is going to be better, and uh, we're going to overcome uh, wars and and hatred and discrimination, racism. But if we're going to do it 
through science and reason and uh, and logic. Uh, so he he is definitely um, deifying the uh, the technology. How does his views on religion manifest themselves in the Star Trek mm-hmm. series? Right, that um, many have seen, and and if you if you uh, let's say sit down binge watch a lot of Star Trek, that you notice a recurring theme uh, that when you have characters who are godlike, now they're never going to be gods because that, again that was the, the that was the order from Roddenberry that there's going to be nothing mystical and supernatural there. But he has life forms, he has aliens that might have uh, various uh, say telekinetic powers or or uh, um, other other abilities that that are not explained by magic. And then what kind of characters are they? All of them are are just really uh, destructive, uh, malicious capricious, basically jerks. That, that every, <laughs> you know, every, um, you know, every single godlike character in, uh, in, in, in Star Trek is going to be a, a real pain for the, for the crew and oftentimes cause, cause trouble for its own sake. And then uh, really the, uh, the undertone there is, 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 is the question that even, even the faithful uh, will be grappling with, that you know, if, there, uh, if there is a, a, a god, uh, an an omnipotent uh, being out there who has all of these powers, you know, he can do uh, whatever he wants. Then, you know, why do we have all of the uh, all of the the, the, the problems, all of the uh, the destruction, the pain, the evil in the world? So, right. Star Trek is kind of suggesting that, well, um, if there was a god and he had all of these powers, but we still have all of the trouble, it must be because he's a sadistic jerk. <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> you, you don't want to believe that there's a sadistic jerk in in in, in charge of everything. So. Let's just move past that. So you bring up this this theme, which is not just common in in Star Trek or or uh, uh, science fiction, but really common in uh, common question in literature. The, this problem of evil. Uh, it's interesting that Roddenberry takes that view. I, I don't get the philosophical conundrum as much as maybe I should. I guess to me, uh, if you picture a God who has all power. Um, and he can stop evil from mm-hmm. happening. Um, well, how does one do that? You control, you stop people, and therefore you make people not free. Basically, a lot of utopian mm-hmm. or, or, or people who present a utopian future ends up dystopian, right? Because, because they, contr- they try to control everything. And to me, this is the idea, this is why... <clears throat> this is why this question of uh, evil has never presented a problem because if God stopped evil from happening, the only way to do that is by controlling us, not allowing us to have free will. And so the question you have to ask, at least, is what would you rather have? Nothing bad happen, but everyone essentially not free. Right. Or that we be free and allowed to to make our choices and and if you believe in God which I do that God somehow compensates later for the pain and suffering that we that we experience and maybe we become better and grow from it. So it's, it's, it's a very good point because you know, we want uh, we want free will, um, but if if we want that, then we have the free will to to choose to hurt somebody right. else. Right. But you know, if let's say um, I'm suddenly the victim of somebody else's uh, malicious free will, it sucks. Uh, it, it sucks, <laughs> and I'm not going to be you know maybe very happy with uh, with the God who created that uh, that that free will at that point. Or say, well, I'm I still love him and I still worship him and I'm going to be there and church on Sunday. So that I can understand too. Right. That reminds me of this excellent uh, line in uh, one of Dean Koontz's books, who's an interesting writer because he kind of uh, straddles a lot of genres. Uh, that at one point, he was uh, writing things that definitely fit into uh, into horror, uh, which is close to fantasy because they have magical things. And But a lot of it, especially recently, um, were the, uh, the, the, the unusual, the, uh, um, the out of the ordinary, unexplained, um, has a scientific um, explanation, but on that issue, um, in one of his books, uh, he has a, he has this character, this really laid back surfer uh, character, and he says uh, something to the effect that uh, I never trusted anybody who wants to change the world and has utopian visions because what 
all of those people eventually do is they want to go and control others and take freedoms away. You know, just for a little while, just just give up a little bit of your freedom, you'll get it back, and and you, you'll you'll be better off for it. Uh, trust me. So so I mean, I'm I'm a big Dean Koontz fan, especially when when he is uh, mixing the uh, the science and, and and philosophical questions like this as well. Because uh, I mean, he's uh, isn't it also interesting uh, with, a, with, a, with his life that in his youth uh, back in the uh, back in the 60s uh, that uh, he was, was a lot of his early science fiction was strongly anti-religious and then later he went through a religious conversion as I understand oh, he's, a, uh, he's a, ca- a Catholic a very serious Catholic now you know so he's he, he's, he's oftentimes uh, um, in his in his books you can see this kind of wrestling uh, with um, if there's all this destruction um, and evil and people choose to do evil you know how can I keep my faith and he says well but look at how many people also choose to do good and all of the good thing that that's uh, that that's causing so the the two uh, balance each other out and and don't lose faith yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Be, because of that now you're a writer of science fiction we're uh, you've written this book confirmation investigations of the unexplained i can tell you're a very thoughtful person so obviously you uh, have considered these big questions as you go into writing what's your f- personal faith background or lack of faith background? Well, I'm, I'm coming from a family that's uh, Catholic on my father's side and, and Protestant on my, my mother's side. Okay. The, uh, people ask me, so well, I would say I know, half Catholic. So I say, well, which half? And so <laughs> oh, oh, joking around. There's, although, you know, personally, I'm, I, I could also compare myself to two fictional characters. Okay. Like uh, um, Fox Mulder in the X-Files, where he's asked if he believes, and he says, I want to believe. Okay. That, that he wants to, uh, but there's uh, there's also skepticism that's sure. there. Or the other one would be uh, would be Robert Langdon and the uh, Dan Brown books, where where he's uh, he's also a, a he's coming from a, from an upbringing in religion, you know, but at the same time, uh, in 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 one of the uh, one of the books and and in the movies as well, he says that absolute faith. It was a gift that I was just never given. So so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of grappling with it. I want to believe, but I like the scientific proof as well. Sure, sure. And, it's very, and, uh, very appealing to feel confident mm-hmm, sure, uh, with sure. empirical mm-hmm. evidence. You know, I, I also admire people of absolute faith, uh, people who say they've always believed. I'm always shocked at it, though, mm-hmm. because it's it's so, you know, a belief in God is so fantastic that I, I, I'm I'm a little bit flabbergasted. I respect people of absolute mm-hmm. faith who just have all they they learned something and they've just always accepted it as truth. Um, I sometimes think there might be some naivety in that. Oh, well, but, I think so. Mm-hmm. But uh, but I respect it. But I'm not. I'm not that way at all, and it sounds like you're not either. Oh, where, no. <laughs> where you you uh, and and I do believe, but I but I had to grapple with it, right? I still I still grapple with it, right? I still have questions that I go, eh, this seems unlikely, mm-hmm. you know. Sure, uh, sure. And there and and so, um, how, how did any of did any of your grappling your your skepticism? Mm-hmm. Your struggle work its way into your book. Yes, that, that, that's that's the core of it. Um, because I mean, p- part of the grappling, I think, for everyone, let's say if they're born into religion, as they'll say, "Well, um, it was a luck of the draw. How can I be sure exactly. that I was born in the right one?" I right. mean, I'm coming from a Christian family, the what odds if, just don't uh, sure, seem like sure. I should be uh, exactly, in the right exactly. one. Exactly. Yeah. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's maybe the Hindus are correct or the Muslims. Sure. You know, who knows? So so that's why. Uh, it, and, and and that's that's uh, the plot of the of the of the book too that you have this unexplained event and then how uh, people from from various uh, points of view uh, religious uh, perspectives skeptical uh, perspectives you know new age uh, perspectives that how they try to make sense of the uh, of this unexplained event you have these uh, uh, these giant uh, granite balls these big globes sh- showing up all over the world and there's no explanation for it but it's there you know so what what sense do we uh, do, do we make of that and how all of these various uh, various uh, points of view start clashing, where each feels that well, I'm right and and, and you're wrong. Fascinating again, overlap between uh, sci-fi and religion. We've mentioned Gene Roddenberry, who obviously is a 
pivotal figure in science fiction. Who would you consider the Shakespeare of science fiction? Um, probably most people uh, would say that it's H.G. Wells. I, I would agree with that, uh, that all of the things that are just you know, such standard bedrocks of the genre, alien invasion, uh, genetic uh, engineering, uh, time travel, invisibility, he dealt with all of these. It's, it's really, really remarkable uh, about you know, how um, he came up with these ideas that took, you know, such a hold in the imagination and it does of, seem of that, readers. And it seems like after H.G. Wells, there's, you know, before there's this Greek Lucian and mm -hmm. there's, uh, you know, uh, certainly Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Right, right. Um, a few books, Jules Verne mm -hmm, obviously sure, had a sure. bunch, but it seems like after H.G. Wells, there's an explosion of science fiction. Is that because of his work? I don't know. Was it that popular, or or is it just the explosion of technology that coincides with this timeline? Uh -huh. Right, it's both. That that the success of his um, uh, of his fiction, and then as we're entering into the 20th century, it's the, it's the century of technology, and then you know others are coming along. And also with uh, with Wells, he was just so remarkably prescient about the world events, like the outbreak of of uh, World War Two. Uh, that really, that it it uh, it's almost you're, you're you're you almost want to bring some fantasy. Right. Did he have a crystal ball, or, or did he have a, a time machine hidden right. away somewhere? Right. So, so um, you, as we see uh, that the 20th century really is the, the the century of high technology, and then how destructive uh, it can be—not just uh, helpful, but we see uh, World War One and and World War Two and all the destruction right. and that, uh, that that technology can create. It is just really the uh, uh, the, the the literature, and then later the uh, the filmmaking. Of the uh, of the twentieth century. What are some sci-fi writers that look at religion positively, or have used science fiction to? What are some examples where religion is either viewed positively, or or uh, they view science fiction as possibly an allegory for for spiritual mm -hmm. principles? Mm -hmm. or Lessons. Right, right. Well, well, C.S. Lewis, of course, well, mo most people uh, know him for the Narnia uh, books and, and coming uh, from, a, from a religious uh, background, a religious faith. Sure. Um, he also wrote the, uh, the Space Trilogy uh, books with, with, with travels into space and to, okay. uh, and to Mars. So uh, his Christian values were informing uh, those, uh, those books as well. He was another famous skeptic before, you know, he converted mm -hmm. to Christianity from, from atheism. But uh, ultimately, the uh, the theme the uh, the message is coming from his uh, from his religious faith. Okay. Or another um, major uh, book uh, dealing with, uh, with with science, especially post apocalyptic uh, world where science destroys, uh, is a book called uh, Canticle for Leibovitz uh, from Walter Miller. Okay. Uh, where uh, you have it, at the start of the book, uh, the world has been destroyed by by a nuclear war, and then uh, society is trying to rebuild itself. Now you have uh, the the, the these groups of people or these genetic mutants because of uh, radiation. And this goes on for, uh, for, 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 for centuries and centuries. So basically, he's describing a very, um, very bad future. You know? But uh, you have monks, right? So you have religious uh, figures who are trying to, uh, uh, trying to um, find and then maintain the, uh, the knowledge of the past you know, so that oh. hopefully you know, that way the, uh, the world can be, uh, can be rebuilt. Uh, so so it, it's, it's almost like... Like uh, when you're looking at the uh, at the church and, and monasteries end up in the dark ages, they're trying to uh, to, uh, to to hold on to the uh, to the lost knowledge of right. the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans and make sure that it uh, doesn't disappear because there's good things uh, in here. At the same way, you have the uh, uh, you have religion uh, attempting to um, uh, to preserve the uh, preserve facts and the truth and and, and science. And then uh, his characters though. Are you know, kind of uh, kind of grappling with the question. I'm uh, trying to uh, uh, trying to preserve uh, the knowledge of an old world and maybe bring it back. But it was a world that destroyed itself. Uh, so it's 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 it's, it's uh, the book doesn't give easy answers and it goes and asks the questions. Uh, of course, about well, if 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 God exists, then why did He let us destroy ourselves like this, and and why we're living in this in this terrible world? But it's uh, ultimately it is a very um, it, it's a very pro-religious. Uh, work. Stories that are either pro-religion mm -hmm. or or 
anti-religion or maybe just pro-science. Um, and certainly the pro-religion, how does that ever happen unintentionally? And I, maybe you can't mm -hmm. answer this question, but I'd love to ask mm -hmm. George Lucas, because right. I know my father saw massive symbolism, religious symbolism in the force, right? They even in the, in the, uh, series, they call it an ancient religion and, and mm -hmm. those kind right. of things. And I would love to ask George Lucas, or maybe, you know, if he's spoken mm -hmm. on this, you know, does he encourage that idea? Did he do that intentionally? Is he a person mm -hmm. of faith? Mm -hmm. I, I'm not certain of, of George Lucas's uh, faith, because, but, but he did say when he uh, originally wrote Star Wars that he meant it as a, uh, as, as a moral guide uh, for, for young people. And that, yeah, he said that he wanted to do a space age mythology, but one that teaches uh, moral messages, that there's, there's good and there's evil, right. and, you can, uh, and you can make a choice, and there's, there, there's redemption. If you you've uh, if you've done wrong uh, so so that's that's uh, the philosophical uh, position that, that he's coming from as, as, as I understand with uh, with Miller as well that that he's coming from uh, from he's being informed by uh, by religion by, by his own faith as well what about just religious archetypes or anti-religious mm -hmm. Uh, archetypes. So that's that's the fascinating thing that the science fiction is uh, full of uh, so many archetypes are so similar uh, to, uh, uh, to to religious uh, texts and coming from all, all kinds of religious like savior figures and 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 prophets. Uh, you see the, those in major uh, religions, and then you have savior figures in in science fiction too. And and some of them, you know, very very explicitly draw that connection. Right. Like I think of the Matrix. Right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That, that, that there you have the uh, uh, the big question of of many religions. The 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 impermanent world around me. Is this it? You know, is there some greater wisdom? Is there some something behind this? You know, how do I uh, you know, how how do I live uh, so that I will be saved uh, by God and go to heaven? Or or say like the Buddhist uh, wants to know how do I get how do I reach to that to that point of uh, of enlightenment where I I, I achieve a, a greater truth Nirvana. and and right and and. Then and that's that's basically the matrix that the world that we see is not real, and then uh, there's a prophesized Messiah, the One, uh, right. who will who will come and 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 wake everybody else from this from this uh, false consciousness. And there's another character, uh, Morpheus, who who had heard the uh, the prophecies and is absolutely sure, and he's devoting himself to finding this Messiah. You know, so automatically you're you're, you're thinking of John the Baptist. Right? So and, and then on the end of the first matrix. Uh, the Keanu Reeves character now calling himself uh, Neo, or you can rearrange the words, right? The one right. Uh, that he gets shot and, and and he dies for a moment. That we see him flatlining, uh, but then he gets resurrected, and that's where he attains his his, his true powers, uh, where he's able to break uh, now people out of the uh, out of the matrix. So right. it's, it's 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 very very uh, you know, Christian uh, sounding. Although you're going to have other religions who are say, well. Wait a minute. We have uh, we believe in messiahs and saviors. You know, right. the, uh, apparently uh, you have a lot of Buddhist uh, fans of the Matrix and say, yes. Yeah, so he Neo is actually he's the Buddha, and then he's he's, he's attaining enlightenment when he when he's able to. Uh, it's the beauty uh, of archetypes. Mm -hmm. You sure, can, uh, sure. Everyone mm -hmm. can interpret it there as their own, right? Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. What uh, what other examples or 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 examples of. Uh, you know, anti-religion. Do you have? In <laughs> well, there there are other archetypes. I mean, not necessarily anti-religious, but the archetype of um, of evil figures, of the uh, the evil characters. Uh, there's a, a science fiction miniseries from uh, from the 1980s that I was a big fan of um, at the time, and I, I understand it was one of the most successful uh, sci-fi miniseries um, of the decade. It was called V, okay. and then it had this uh, sequel, V: The Final Battle, uh, where you have aliens who look like humans. Humans. They're, they're wearing human masks, but they're, they're, they're reptilians underneath. And they come to Earth, and they say that we're here um, as friends. You know, we, we come in peace. And they say they just want a small favor, that, that, that we, we want to uh, um, manufacture some chemicals that we can only do on Earth. And, as, and if you guys let us do this, then there's a line uh, where the leader says, we will gladly share with you all the fruits of our knowledge. And since they're reptilians, immediately you're, you're thinking, well, like the, the, the serpent. This, you know, the serpent in the yeah. garden. Exactly, and the, and, and the, the gift, the, the apple of the, from the fruit of, uh, from the, the tree of, of, of knowledge of good and evil. It seems a common theme in 
science fiction is when scientists try to play God. Mm -hmm. What do we see with that idea? Right. Most often it doesn't turn out well. I mean, going back, some would say that Mary Shelley is actually a Shakespeare of, of science fiction. And it's about a scientist creating life. Frankenstein. And, uh, Frankenstein. Yeah. And, and it does not go well. Or, or with Wells, the, uh, the island of Dr. Moreau. That, that turns out to, be, uh, to, to go very badly as well. Or when, uh, when scientists create artificial intelligence, you know, perfect robots. It turned out to be the Terminator and they go right. and destroy, they destroy the world. Or, you know, back in the 50s, you had the cycle of the giant bug movies uh, where, where radiation goes and mutates uh, the, uh, uh, the, the insects and they turn out to be a big monster to try to destroy the world. And, and, and in so many of them, in those 50s movies, you have a scene on the end where you have the scientists give some speech, you know, something to the effect that, well, there are just some things that man was not meant to know. <laughs> or various, various, sometimes they even bring God into it. That we had uh, trespassed into uh, God's territory. <laughs> and so, so yeah, so, uh, so scientists playing God uh, is, is, is not endorsed in, 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 most, uh, in most science fiction. Uh, it's, it's seen as, as an ultimate act of hubris, which then uh, goes, and, goes and backfires. And there you can, you can see the, the genre's warning that you know, so much of scientific technology could be uh, misused. And, and you see, uh, say, like in the biological uh, sciences, as I understand, probably in every uh, university and biology programs, uh, you're going to have at least a class, a required class on bioethics. About uh, kind of like the question uh, that the, the Jeff Goldblum uh, character asks in Jurassic Park: "Just because I can do it, you know, should I uh, right. do it?" Uh, so, so scientists do uh, do grapple with that. Is it difficult to just let the story run its course? Uh, and not make it too much of a discourse on these big questions uh, because, again, you're considering them. How difficult is it to balance the story with um, trying to say something? Mm -hmm. Really, so, somebody who says down to write fiction, you know, first they should be entertainers. You know, they they, they should know that you know somebody is picking this up. They've had a hard day at work and they want to relax. You know, maybe get some uh, some interesting ideas out of it, some 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 thinking points. But they want a good adventure story or or a mystery or compelling characters. Uh, so that that's what I was trying to uh, to do with uh, with the book too. You know, entertain first. Uh, that I think they're. Some really exciting action sequences in there. Okay, um, there, there there's a love story, so you get oh, get that out, of, uh, get that up front and center, and then have the characters deal uh, with a problem uh, that uh, makes you ask questions. But but yeah, I, I don't think people like uh, somebody on a soapbox going and, sure, and preaching. I agree. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they would read nonfiction for that. Right. For, for right. fiction, entertain first. You mentioned uh, earlier um, in a previous conversation something about. Uh, astronauts and their experience going to space, uh, coming back more spiritual. What, what, what have you heard about that? Yeah, apparently, uh, people who've studied uh, the psychology uh, of astronauts and uh, or interviewed them, what happened with them afterwards, many of them uh, said that uh, if they were religious to begin with, like, like John Glenn, you know, he said that it strengthened uh, his religion. Or others who never really gave it much of a thought, uh, they said that when you're floating out in space and you're just, just, just completely overwhelmed by, by the grandness of the universe that, yeah. that makes you uh, um, think about how did this come to be or, or appreciate you know how, um, how how valuable how precious life on earth is uh, so so many of them did say that uh, that their, their their spirituality were, was strengthened you had uh, astronauts who uh, uh, there's there there's uh, one astronaut and his name escapes me at the moment when he was on the International Space Station and they connect I mean he was a regular churchgoer yeah. and and they connected him him in with his uh, with his church uh, for for Sunday service, and then you know he was following the uh, the uh, the priest along from the from the space station, and, and he said that uh, yeah the, the space flight and all of the science all this technology around me it does not dampen my faith at all. It it, it makes me yearn to go back to Earth and immediately you know go to uh, go to go to church and and you know share my strength and spirituality. Barna, this has been incredibly enjoyable. Thank you for your expertise in the science fiction field and uh, your insights into science fiction and religion and their complicated relationship. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. It's been my pleasure. Thanks for having me. 
Lightwise is a video podcast production of Angel Studios, released every other Tuesday. To watch more episodes or be notified of new episodes of Lightwise, download the Angel app now, wherever you get your apps. Also, to make sure you don't miss The Shift, Angel Studios' upcoming sci-fi film with religious elements, download the Angel app now. If you'd prefer to listen instead of watch, you can find the Lightwise audio podcast version wherever you get your podcasts. This episode was hosted by Joel Ackerman. It was written and directed by Joel Ackerman, produced by Cameron Jackson and Al Mullins, and edited by Cameron Jackson, with sound mixing by Brian Densley, and additional sound recording by Louise Lafayette.